No. Okie dokie. No. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, yes, I'd love to have the opportunity. Okay. No problem at all, sir. Thank you very much. We're gonna come back to you in one month with one idea and one idea only. You know, if you like what we had to say, great. Hi, I'm Mark Wayshack. Mark is a world-renowned sales trainer, best-selling author of three books on sales, and founder of the Sales Insights Lab, which trains thousands of salespeople every year. And I'm gonna be reviewing movie scenes from Tommy Boy to Boiler Room. The first movie is from Tommy Boy, which is one of my favorite movies as a kid, but I haven't seen these scenes in a long time, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they look like. I gotta do this, I gotta do this, it's gotta be the one, I gotta do this, it's gotta be me, it's gotta be... Are you ready? Yeah, sorry, I'm ready. Hey, does this suit make me look fat? No, 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 your face does. You know, I think one of the things to remember, what's just great about this, is that obviously this is gonna be hilarious and ridiculous, but this is what so many salespeople feel before they go into a meeting. All of our insecurities hit us and we just get nervous. And so, so much about just being effective in sales is having those repetitions, not being nervous, and just having confidence. And having confidence comes from having a process. Okay, let's check you out. All right. <laughs> it's a clip, huh? Hi, are you sure? Yeah. All right, now, it's sale time. So remember, we don't take no... No shit from anyone. No. Uh, we don't take no prisoners. We don't take no for an answer. Oh, yeah. We don't take no for an answer. We don't take no for an answer. We don't... I love this. This is just so much fun. But in reality, we don't take no for an answer. It's like a really old school way of looking at sales. Now, obviously, up front, at the beginning, you do want to push through those initial no's. But no at the end of a sale is a perfectly acceptable outcome. What we really never want to take for an answer is, I need to think about it, which I'm sure he's going to get a lot of in a minute. Sir. No. Okie dokie. No. Gotcha, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific, thanks for your time. So, <laughs> this is great. So obviously that's a good example where, you know, they do their thing, whatever they're doing, I assume some kind of weird sales pitch, and then the guy just says no, which is not realistic, right? In reality, most people are gonna say, this is great, let me think about it, let me get back to you. And then he just completely caves. Obviously in real life, you would have some contingency, you'd wanna dig into that rather than just saying, okie dokie. Let me say, maybe. Well then. I'd just like to add that the spectrometer readout on the nickel-cadmium alloy mix indicates a good ridge strobe and fade, decreasing incidence of wear to the pressure plate. So this is a really good example of technical salespeople really focusing on the tech side and talking to a decision maker who's not a technical person. So this is actually, I think, a real thing that we see happen in sales. If you have that technical background, you really want to get into the weeds there and what's happening here is that they're speaking a different language. And I think he's about to say that you're not speaking my language. So what we always want to do is even when they say maybe, we want to get them talking. So it's like, when you say maybe, help me understand where your head's at, right? You want to get them going rather than start going into the tectrometer stuff. Just... Whoa, little fella, uh, you're not speaking my language. Mm. What my associate is trying to say is that uh, our new brake pads are really cool. You're not even gonna believe it. Like, um, let's say you're driving along the road with your family, and you're driving along, la la la, woo, and then all of a sudden there's a truck tire in the middle of the road, and you hit the brakes. <laughs> Whoa. Again, this is just such a funny scene that I haven't seen in so long. You are seeing the difference, and I think this is still kind of an old school distinction of like the feature pitch versus the benefits pitch. And so I think both are problematic, even the benefits pitch that Chris Farley is doing a pretty comical job of doing, right? He's not engaging the prospect, he's not getting him actually talking, he's just doing this like really funny uh, pitch that's clearly gonna be a disaster. In real life, what we would really wanna be doing is getting the prospect talking, getting them uh, to open up, to tell us how they're using brake pads right now, how it's going, all that. Whoa, that was close. <laughs> now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pads. You're driving along, you're driving <laughs> along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling from the back seat, I gotta go to the bathroom, daddy. Not now, damn it, truck tire. <laughs> I can't stop! Oh, help! 
there's a cliff! Ah! <laughs> and your family's screaming, oh my God! Probably not a good idea to take something on a prospect's desk and, <laughs> and do that, but it is very funny. Let's finish it. Oh my God, we're burning alive! No, I can't feel my legs! In comes a meat wagon! Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. And the medic gets out and says, oh my God. <laughs> New guy's in the corner puking his guts out. The, the look on the prospect's face, it's so hard to take this seriously, but if you're talking to a prospect and they're showing anything on their face that seems they don't agree or they're uncomfortable, you've got to obviously stop. I mean, Chris Farley here is clearly completely in his own head. And so as soon as a prospect is showing something that doesn't seem like they're into, you, you stop. But neither here nor there. Let's finish this. All because you want to save a couple extra pennies. And <laughs> to me, it doesn't get out. Now. Sir. <sighs> Do you validate? No. Okay, thank you. So that's just obviously a fantastic movie scene. Pretty unrealistic in real life. You know, how many times have you ever been kicked out of an office? I've been kicked out of an office a couple of times for just taking things too far. And I think that that's a really awesome experience to have gone through to know how far you can push a prospect. There's very few people that I know that have ever been kicked out of offices, uh, this, this being a comical example, but I do think that we should not be afraid of getting kicked out of offices because it doesn't really ever happen. And so be willing to push it, be willing to take things further, and obviously don't do weird sales pitches like this. So let's look at the next movie, which is Pursuit of Happiness. And let's see the cold call scene from Pursuit of Happiness. Whoever brought in the most money after six months was usually hired. Yes, hello, Chris Gardner calling from Mr. Walter Hawk. We were all working our way up call sheets to sign clients. From the bottom to the top. Yes, sir. From the doorman to the CEO. Okay. They'd stay till seven, but I had Christopher. I had to do in six hours what they'd do in nine. There's some good stuff in here from a sales mindsets perspective. You know, he talks about how he did in six hours what most people do in nine. That is so true. Uh, most salespeople are so inefficient with their day that if you are really efficient, uh, I have an idea called the five hour sales day, which is basically you can do in five hours what any other salesperson can do in eight or nine hours simply by being really efficient and making sure that you're not wasting your time. So I think that's actually uh, a really good, I, clearly this is from a guy that was a top performing salesperson and that's, that's actually very smart. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Gardner. I'm calling from Dean Witter. In order not to waste any time, I wasn't hanging up the phone in between calls. Okay, thank you very much. I realized that by not hanging up the phone, I gained another eight minutes a day. Again, this is a good example. I think a lot of times, and granted, not many of us are in a true boiler room like this where we're just back-to-back -back dials, and obviously now you have auto dialers. But that is true, right? I mean, if you make a call and most salespeople doink around for 20 minutes in between calls, and by, uh, by just really moving along and holding yourself accountable, you can actually be really efficient. Another thing I'll note on this is if you listen to his calls, he's really using a, a very salesy voice. Clearly, Will Smith or this character doesn't actually talk like that in real life. And so the, hey, how are you today? It's good, it, it's, it sounds immediately salesy and prospects will pick up on that really quickly. One thing I always say is you wanna to talk to people like you would talk to a friend at a bar. And so you want to talk really casually and comfortably. Of course, you wanna be professional, but you don't want to use the really fancy voice that's going to immediately tell prospects that this is a sales call. Why, good morning to you. My name is Chris Gardner, I'm calling from Dean Little. I also wasn't drinking water, so I didn't waste any time in the bathroom. I could not not drink water during the day, but that uh, makes sense. Uh, yes, I'd love to have the opportunity. Okay, no problem at all, sir. Thank you very much. If you listen to his call, I know the call is not really central so far yet. His call is, is not very good, but he's getting pushback and immediately it's like, okay, well, thanks so much for your time, as opposed to having a contingency. We're going to hear an example in a minute from Boiler Room where they're just, they have tons of contingencies and fallbacks. When you're making a prospecting call, you have to expect that they're gonna try to get you off the phone. So you don't just say, oh, well, thanks so much for your time. You're going to want to push back. That's just good sales. 
But even doing all this, after two months, I still didn't have time to work my way up a sheet. So we're about to see him make a call to the CEO. And I think this is a really good lesson, which is that, you know, most of the people that he's selling against are calling on low level folks. And what he's doing is he's calling a really high level decision maker. And I think this is something that not enough salespeople do. Every salesperson should have like a top 20 dream prospects of who, if, if you could get in front of this person, it could change your business. Who would that person be? And reach out to those people, prospect to those people. Don't just call low level prospects. There's some clearly some mindset stuff that's really good. And you can see this is from real life. I think the calls themselves are, are pretty bad, but I think that's a really good takeaway is call high, call the CEO. Why, why work your way up the list? Just call to the damn CEO. Yeah. Walter Ribbon's office. Yes, hello, my name is Chris Gardner. I'm calling from Mr. Walter Ribbon. Concerning? Yes, ma'am, I'm calling from Dean Witter. Just a moment. So this is a classic gatekeeper scenario and it's not good, but it's actually not terrible. One thing that we always say is be vague when you're dealing with a gatekeeper. She says, what is this concerning? And he says, yes, ma'am, I'm with Dean Witter. It sounds really salesy. There's no way that that gatekeeper would let him through in real life. I think that's maybe in the time period when this was made, possibly. But I think in reality, we want to be a little bit more vague. And you, you have two approaches. One is you can be super nice and friendly and straightforward, or you can be really vague and um, and just really try to get through. Um, he's, he's kind of splitting the difference, which I think is certainly not effective today. Hello? Mr. Ribbon. Well, uh, hello, sir. My name's Chris Gardner. I'm calling from Dean Witter. Yeah, Chris. Uh, yes, Mr. Ribbon, I would love to have the opportunity to sit with you to discuss some of our products. This is where it really becomes a train wreck, right? I mean, his opening is not very good. He's gonna get hung up a lot um, by using that, like, hey, this is you know George Jones with Dean Witter. Then he really goes into a bad script, which is like, I'd love to show you more about our products. I mean, that is a really bad opening to a call. This guy is a high level decision maker. He's busy, he's important. He's gonna just have no interest in this salesperson. I mean, it is like such a salesy call. Really, really ineffective. He's not trying to really engage him. I think you've got to have that first 30 to 30 seconds to one minute be really tight and just really riveting and value packed. And this is just complete junk. I I'm certain that I could be of some assistance to you. Can you be here in 20 minutes? Uh, uh, 20 minutes, absolutely. Prospects are always saying W-I-I-F-M, as we always say, what's in it for me? This is a CEO of some big brokerage or something. He doesn't have time for this. In real life, that call is just not going to go well. Maybe in the 70s or 80s that's possible, but certainly not today. In your calls, it's gonna be really clear what's in it for the prospect to continue the phone call. And just saying, I really think that I could serve you. And it's like, that's super weak sauce and it's just not going to work in a call. And then can you get here in 20 minutes? It makes for a good movie, but it's it's, it's so unrealistic. Just had someone cancel. Come now, I can give you a few minutes before the 49ers. Monday night football, buddy. Yes, sir, thank you very much. See you soon. So again, this is, I, I think, pretty problematic. If he has an appointment canceled, he's gonna take that 20 minutes and do something else. He's not just like sitting around waiting for something to do. But it is, it's a, I, this is a beautiful movie. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, I think this scene is uh, a a genuinely bad sales scene for a movie and I think is not instructive at all, except from those mindset perspectives that we talked about. Love the movie, the scene from a sales perspective, not not so good. So let's lastly look at Boiler Room. This is a really hardcore scene in these movies. It's a lot of um, stock stockbroker movies, which again, selling stocks, particularly in the time period when this was happening, I'm sure it was really cutthroat. The idea of like a stockbroker isn't really common anymore. It's much more like wealth advisors. What we're about to see is really hardcore. And I mean, it's called Boiler Room for a reason. Let's take a look though and uh, and see see what this is all about. I'm really busy, sir. No, look, I, no, I understand. Doctor, I'm, you know, I'm really busy here myself. So this is a good example though. I talked about contingencies. It's not a good contingency. I'm really busy myself. That's not gonna work. Um, also, he's calling on a doctor, calling on doctors, just the likelihood that you're going to get a doctor to pick up the phone for a stockbroker just feels really 
unlikely. Maybe back then that was possible. But at least he does have a contingency. It's really old school and I would argue kind of cheesy, but you know, he's got contingencies. He's ready to go. We're gonna come back to you in one month with one idea and one idea only. You know, if you like what we have to say, great. You know, we'll, we'll do business. If not, I mean, worst case scenario, you're gonna hear yourself a new business idea. You, Whoever you're took that x-ray, it, it is useless. We're, we're gonna part as friends. That's fair, right? Of what? Th Doc, are you working with a million dollars in the market right now? Who is this again? Clearly, this is written by someone who makes cold calls. I mean, it's it, there is a lot realistic here where you, you do, I think when you're making cold calls, we forget that your prospects are doing a million different things. They're looking at, nowadays they're checking their email, they've got someone else in the office. There, there's so much going on and we forget that a lot of times they don't hear the first 20 seconds of our call. And so that's why it's so important to have so many contingencies when you're making these types of calls. I think this is actually quite realistic. I like the idea that he's like focused on like one idea. Again, I think it's like we could do business together it just feels like really cheesy but um you know there's there's some stuff here and hey, you know tell me something you're a doctor have you ever heard of a drug called benadryl it's being manufactured by msc pharmaceuticals no well listen listen okay listen it's in the third stage of fda approval all right word is it's going to be approved within the next three months and it could be tomorrow for all i know but you know i, I you know i'm getting ahead of myself it's a cheesy call but he is doing some things that I think are good, right? He's, he's actually demonstrating some insight. He's talking about this particular stock. Again, I don't really do a lot of sales with stock brokers, stock traders, but um, that is the insight and value that someone in, who's selling this would have, which is like, hey, we've got this stock, and um, you tell about it, it's in the third phase of clinical trials. Like, now you're actually demonstrating some insight. And so I think that's, you know, he got his attention. And I think that's, that's kind of realistic. Getting ahead of myself, and you're real busy over there, so why don't I just send you out the information you requested about the firm. So this is actually, I, one thing I love about this is that he's actually using like a real pullback where it's like he gave him some insight and information and then he's kind of like pulling back. It's a little early, I think, to use that, but um, you know, there's this old idea that if you take it away, if you're like, yeah, it sounds like you're busy though, so I'll let you go. Now, you really, that's a strong bluff and there's a very good chance that he'll be like, okay, great, I gotta go, thanks. But it, it does happen to work in this uh, pretend scenario. No, wait, 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 forget the info, forget the info. Let's talk about this now. Just another thing, um, the info, right? So many of your prospects are gonna be asking for information. Can you send me information? And 99 out of 100 times, it's just a nice way of them saying, I need to get the hell off the phone, go away. Right, and so I think this is a good example, again, written by a real salesperson who understands that the info is always BS, right? No one ever wants your info. They just wanna get off the damn phone. What was the name of that drug again? Could you hold on for one second? Uh, I'm gonna get uh, uh, a senior broker who's a little more familiar with that particular stock, all right? Hold on a second, okay? One second. I don't know back in the day how this worked. I imagine this is actually pretty real just based on what I'm seeing so far. But I think it's pretty risky to try to transition to a new person this early in the call. I would want this kind of business development rep kind of guy to be taking it a bit further. Because this guy could hang up at any point. And so this idea of like transferring that quickly feels a little clunky. Could be realistic, but I think it's risky. They don't want to like a schedule a next step because you're never going to get this doctor back on the phone. But I think it's probably a little early to transfer over. But I think we're about to be in for a fun scene. So this is hilarious, right? So it's like, you've got like the big boys coming in and they're fighting over it. In real life, I don't think that's how uh, uh, you'd structure it. Obviously this guy would work for one guy, one account executive or sales guy. I assume the idea of just like screaming in a room being like, Rocco, is probably unrealistic. I mean, I mean, they've got so many people making calls. This must, should happen all the time. Again, makes for good, good TV. Okay, so his name is Dr. Jacobs and I, I'd say from the sound of it, he's definitely- Well, I don't wanna hear it, kid. Okay. This is so good. Um, this is a good example of, you know, newer salespeople want to like tell you everything about what's going on with the prospect. And the reality is, is like, just tell me his name. Obviously, it's like a little background, but you can see this, the, the little, the, the little business development rep is like, he does, you know, I think he's, it's like, dude, stop it. I don't want to hear about it. I like that. That's good. And I think again, pretty realistic. Hi, Dr. Jacobs. This is Chris Marlin over at JT Marlin. Marlin? Right. He's my father. 
<laughs> so my associate tells me you're interested in one of our stocks. So this is a lost opportunity in real life. This is where you'd want to focus on this specific stock. You wouldn't say, I, so my associate tells me that you're interested in one of our stocks. You would focus on the actual stock. It just seems like wasted back and forth in real life. I will call her back. Uh, yes, uh, MSC sounds like it might be interesting. Might be. Might be doesn't sell stock at the rate MSC is going for Dr. Jacobs. We're talking very high volume here. I, I know what they're trying to do. And again, it makes for really good TV. But I don't think this would work in real life in any scenario. The guy says might be, and he comes back. Like, it's too early to do that stuff. I think you can do that later on in the sales process once there's been some relationship developed and you understand what's going on. But to do that so early as like your opening move, that is a super hardcore power move that I think is gonna turn off a lot of good prospects. And so I think the idea is good. It's a little premature in the sales process. Well, I still have to run it by my people. That's great, Doc, if you want to miss yet another opportunity here and watch your colleagues get rich doing clinical trials and don't buy a share and hang up the phone. He said, like, I'm, I'm still going to have to talk to So, so it's like just a classic rebuttal, which it doesn't really make sense. I think that's kind of like weird writing because it's kind of early. They haven't even like talked about the specifics of the stock yet, but they're just clearly trying to get through this like objection handling scene. Now, as far as how he's handling the objections, the rule of thumb nowadays is not that you like the objection happens and then you like hit them with some pre-recorded line, but instead that you, you would dig into that to find out where their head's at. This is a little strange and you can feel Hollywood's role here. Well, hold on a second now. I didn't say that. I just want to talk about it some more. Honestly, doc, I don't have the time. This stock is blowing up right now. The whole firm's going nuts. Hold on, let me open up the door to my office. See that, Doc? That's my trading floor. Now I have a million calls to make to a million other doctors who are already in the know. I can't walk you through this right now. I'm sorry. This is real hardcore sales that I've really never seen someone pull off in real life. And maybe I'd love if in the comments, if you've ever done something like this and it, and it works, great. But it's so hardcore that it's hard to imagine a prospect where you have no relationship with them. I mean, this was on a cold call and you're talking to a doctor who's like, doctors are not gonna be pushed around and he's playing real hardball. I like, it makes for good TV. I feel like they're condensing a, what a real call would be like and there's just no way that that would work in real life that quickly you know it's like on a date you're just like rushing to like you're just moving too quickly okay okay let's do this <laughs> Okay, so this is a really powerful thing though, is the silence, he's letting the doctor be silent. There are moments in sales, again, this is super condensed. I mean, we do this in our firm, when we you know, talk about certain things, like we, our rule of thumb is like, be silent, don't break the silence. Let the prospect break the silence. And that is super powerful. Again, it wouldn't be typically this early on in the call, because here we are only a, like two minutes into the call for them. It's really fast, but that is really powerful. Now, since you're a new account, I cannot go any higher than 2,000 shares. I'm sorry. 2,000? Are you nuts? That is way beyond what I was thinking. 2,000? Jesus. So <laughs> it's really funny. I mean, I've never seen that move. It would be so transparent to a prospect nowadays. They're selling a stock to a doctor, so doctors aren't necessarily going to be super business savvy necessarily around stocks. So maybe this could have worked. But I think if you're selling to a high level prospect, that would just not work. I mean, someone who is a savvy, which most prospects are, that's just, that, that's gonna be so transparent. He's taking like the super high price, like the big thing, and he's like setting it like it's low. But again, I think for most people, that's gonna be pretty transparent. Listen, I'm curious, why can't you sell me any more than that? <laughs> well, we that's like to funny. establish a relationship with our clients on something small before we get to the more serious trades. There's a lot of sneaky, manipulative stuff going on here that I think really wouldn't work in real life. But I do like the idea that particularly off a cold call, it's like just get the sale, get one small sale, develop the relationship, get the paperwork squared away. Like, again, this is so short. This would never happen in real life that quickly. But he is like, he's focused on just getting the one sale. And I think that's, I think that's good. Let me show you several percentage points on this small trade, and then we'll talk about doing future business. That sounds good. 
uh, give me the 2,000 shares. Done. He set it really high in terms of like the 2,000 shares, and then he's calling it a small trade. Again, this like this is like real old school persuasion stuff that if, again, in today's day of selling, I just could not imagine a scenario in which that would work because the whole premise here is that this doctor is just like this dopey guy who doesn't know anything, who thinks he's smart. And does that happen in real life occasionally? Yes, but you should never assume that your prospects are dumb. You should assume that you're selling to people that are smart, savvy business people or that are good, well-informed decision makers and that you're helping them make a good decision. Again, this is, I mean, it's called boiler, right? It's they're trying to sell, uh, I think, crap. You sure you can't do any better on this one? I'm sorry, Dr. Jacobs, I can't, I'm sorry. Oh, all right, we'll start with this trade then. Great, I promise we'll swing for the fences on the next one. Fun, but it's just like, it's the doctor who's behaving in a way that's too, he's too into it. Maybe this could happen, but this would be like a very outlier scenario um, and not typical for what a call like this would look like. Do you want that confirmation sent to your office? Or your mansion. Ha <laughs> <laughs> very funny, Mr. Marlin. A really big mistake in sales that a lot of salespeople make is they start to, when they think they've got a sale, they start getting really jokey. And I think that that is a nervous move. Now, obviously in this case, this guy, he knows what he's doing supposedly, but I would never make jokes like that, particularly pertaining to the sale. That is going to be an immediate red flag to a prospect. There's so many things that can go wrong. I would never make a joke with a prospect in that kind of a context. Really high risk move. There's nothing about that that is going to help you close the deal. So don't do it. Let me put my secretary on and she'll take down your info. It was a pleasure doing business with you. Done and done. It's a fun scene. I mean, I, that gets me fired up. Gets me, it makes me want to go out and make cold calls and sell. But there's not much you can learn from that. In real life, you don't want to be, like all of these transfers are really risky. Because every time you're transferring to a new person, it's like the relationship's breaking and that doctor could get pulled away or he could just change his mind. And so you wouldn't want to transfer to the secretary. Like you'd want to get that information. Like we don't even have this guy's info. So I think that's a really risky move. The other thing that I think is just problematic is, you know, one of my mentors used to always say that you don't have the sale until you have the check in hand and the check clears. And this is really, I think, a bad mindset that a lot of amateur salespeople make, which is that they celebrate the sale before it's closed. This guy does not have a sale. Right, think about all of the steps that have to be that have to come. There's gonna be back and forth on paper, there's gonna be a contract signed, there's gonna be money transferred into an account. There's a lot of steps. And to celebrate that at that point, like it's just this closed deal, is actually insane. That's really dumb and not realistic. So I think we always want to be really weary because it would be so easy for this doctor to change his mind. Because all he did was agree to this stock. He got the name of the stock. He could then go to someone else and be like, hey, what do you think of this stock? Can I get it through you? Like there's so many things. In a situation like this, you'd wanna be so cautious to close that deal before you celebrate anything because there's so many things that can go wrong. And that's just true in, in sales in general. I think overall, having looked at all three of these movies, Tommy Boy, Pursuit of Happiness, and Boiler Room, I think obviously it's a lot of fun. And what we realize is that Hollywood is Hollywood. And so to learn sales from a Hollywood scene is very likely not to be very useful. There are a couple of nuggets that, be, that can be gained from these types of movies, but in, Overall, in some, I think there's very little that's actually useful and applicable. And instead, what we really need to do is use a process that's relevant to today's world of selling. Every single one of these movies, the scenes take place in basically the year 2000 or earlier. And so that is just what worked back in those days in the 80s, or maybe even in the 70s, is just not going to work today. And you know, I think we just have to have a systematic process that works right now. So those are my reviews of the sales movie scenes from Tommy Boy to Boiler Room. And if you enjoyed this video, then I have an awesome free training on the data-driven approach to closing more sales in today's economy. Just click right here to get registered instantly. Seriously, just click right here. This is an in-depth training that will help you close more sales at higher prices 
all while generating more meetings. Also, if you got some value, please like this video below on YouTube. That means a lot. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking my face, which should be right about here, to get access to a new video just like this one each week.